Hello, sapphics and supervillains. My name is TB Skyne. And, well, I mean, it's a little late for it now. The Star Guardian thing is pretty much over, and I think most of the League of Legends community has moved on. But nonetheless, I want to talk about the League of Legends music video because I don't know if you noticed this. Like, maybe I, I feel like maybe I'm the only one who, who sort of really, really realized this, but it's actually really good. There's actually some really good storytelling going on there, as well as the impressive animation that's being used. And I thought maybe, maybe I could be the one to let the wider League of Legends community know that this music video is actually good and, and then that they should watch it because I don't think anyone else has really noticed that at all. <laughs> In seriousness, though, the Porter Robinson Everything Goes On music video is a little bit of a masterclass in visual storytelling, because in this music video, we have a two minute piece of animation, pretty much, that needs to convey a whole hell of a lot, and it needs to convey it to people who aren't necessarily familiar with the backstory or what's really going on in the Star Guardians universe, who haven't read all of the previous lore, which, let's be honest, is fairly disorganized and not very well publicized to the public. This is a music video that needs to get people interested in what the hell is going on here. It needs to make them care about these characters and make them invest, or at least be willing to invest some time into finding out what the deal is with them. And it does this genuinely quite brilliantly. So let's take it from the top. Before we do though, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for people who want to explore their own creativity. If there's something you want to learn how to do, odds are pretty good that Skillshare can help. And if you sign up with the link in my description, you'll get a full month of access for free. Skillshare offers video series on self-organizing and prioritizing, including taking care of your mental health while trying to get work done. With a subscription, the fee is ad-free with new premium classes launching every week, which are fully subtitled in Spanish, Portuguese, French, and German. And if you want to get into some creative writing of your own, why not check out the series Learn Screenwriting by Writing One Scene in a Screenplay Format by filmmaker and director Olaf de Fleur. It takes you through every step of the process and introduces you to the craft of screenwriting by, as the title suggests, teaching you to write one scene to start with. And it goes through everything from physical formatting to creative writing exercises, establishing character, backstory, physical expression, and editing and re-editing your drafts, arguably one of the most important skills for any writer. Skillshare has this and dozens of other series besides on every creative endeavor under the sun, so once again, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. We open on this shot of Kaisa and Akali lying in a grassy meadow, holding hands with one another with jewelry around their waists that symbolize their deep connection to one another. The reason why they're doing this is because they're just friends. Um, and the first thing that I that, that kind of catches my eye in this thing, well, I mean, first we have like the lovely animated grass sort of wiggling back and forth in the wind, but it's the gesture, right? Uh, we have these two hands where they're sort of they're sort of like slack around each other, and then there's this little moment where they just they just grasp each other a little bit closer, like not squeezing each other, like ah, but like just just closing their hands a little bit tighter around one another, as though to hold each other closer. Again, because they're just friends. And then we cut to this shot of Akali seen from Kaisa's perspective, right? Um, so like, we, you can see the hands that they're holding like, here in the foreground, and everything is sort of all washed out. It's, it's in very soft focus, the light is extra golden and saturated, and you can see everything that's not Akali's face is kind of blurry. Like it's, And what it's doing here, it's mimicking the POV of Kaisa, right? Like that, the thing that she's staring directly at is in focus, and everything else is a little bit out of focus because that's peripheral vision. So Kaisa is staring very intently at Akali's face. Like that's the only thing she's really focusing on right now is Akali's face, because of course, they are just friends. And then the typical thing you would do for a scene like that is like you set up one shot uh, where one of the characters is looking at the other one, we get their POV, and what a typical thing you might do would be to swap over to the reverse shot and look at Kaisa from Akali's perspective, right? Like that would be sort of the way to establish, oh, we're lying here, we're looking at each other, what's the relationship between us? But we don't get that. Instead, we do cut to the reverse shot, right? Like this is Kaisa lying in this in a similar position, but reversed from Akali. But we're not looking from Akali's POV. Instead, we're in Kaisa's room, and now we're not in anyone's point of view. Now we're just at in like in impartial observer looking at Kaisa as Akali would if they were lying in that position. But instead, Kaisa is waking up as though from a dream and desperately reaching out to 
where Akali used to be from her perspective, right? Like she's reaching out for her friend, like very desperately reaching for her. And there's this little moment of like the jewel, like the friendship bracelet glittering that we get, like to really draw attention to it. And then here we have this, like this moment of complete stillness where nothing in the frame, absolutely nothing whatsoever is moving at all, except the dangling of the little piece of jewelry on the, fr on the friendship bracelet so that the like the animators are doing everything they can to make absolutely 110 billion percent sure that you have noticed this thing and you have noticed that it is important right that's why it's here that's why it shows up here dangling from her wrist like and gets this little moment of complete stillness to be the only thing in frame moving like the animators are really just like you need to notice this thing this thing needs to be on your mind you need to understand that this thing is important and that it symbolizes the relationship between kaisa and akali this will come back later because there's another object in this thing that symbolizes a relationship Anyway, let's talk about my favorite subject. If you've been along to one of these animation breakdowns before, you will know this already, but I'm gonna reiterate it because it is an important basic concept when it comes to animation feel. Most films run at 24 frames per second. Online video usually runs at 30, but TV and film still tends to default to 24 frames per second. If you try to animate something by drawing 24 frames of animation every second, you would need 1,440 frames to produce just one minute of animation, which means that even a short two minute music video like this one would require anywhere from three and a half to 4,000 bespoke frames of animation in order to create it. That's a lot of work and a lot of expense. So animation has found all kinds of ways to get around that. For example, instead of animating at 24 frames per second, you can animate at 12 frames per second. That is, you're animating on every other frame. That immediately cuts the workload in half, and sometimes you can even animate on every third or every fourth frame to save even more time and effort. The price you pay for doing that is that the animation will look less smooth and fluid, so animators over time have developed all kinds of tricks and techniques to create the illusion of smoothness and fluidity even when they're animating at lower frame rates. Animating on every single frame is called animating on ones because you animate on every one frame. Anim Animating on every other frame is called animating on twos because you animate on every two frames and so on with animating on thirds and fourths and etc. And that comes into play here because you can see here that between these two frames, the camera is moving backwards, right? Like the camera here is essentially it's a digital camera, so it doesn't have any limitations on how many frames per second it can run at. It can just run as smooth as, as you could possibly want it to. But even though the camera here is pulling back, no animation is actually happening on screen. Next frame, oh, something is happening. Now something changes from frame to frame, but then something doesn't, then something does, then something doesn't, then something does, then something doesn't. This is animating on twos. And as you can see, if we play that back in full motion, it looks very smooth. Like it has that feel of what we associate with high quality animation. Like it's this is that level of movement um, that we're looking for. And another way um, that you can smooth out the difference, like when you, when you have these little holding frames, right? Like when, when you're animating at, at 12 frames per second in a 24 frames per second video, you have that one frame in between where nothing is happening. You can do this. If you pay attention to Akali's hair and the grass, you can see that they move on alternating frames, right? Like they don't move on the same frames most of the time. They just move on alternating frames. And when you do that, the com combination of not everything on screen is moving at every single frame, but on every single frame, there's almost always something moving, creates this illusion of much greater smoothness than there really is. And that produces this like gorgeous looking animation um, simply by offsetting the timing of the frames that you are rendering on screen. Now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about the thing that's actually going. Kaisa reaches out, we get this little moment of like, like just this little tiny moment of making goddamn sure we notice the amulet. And then we see her sort of lay down, kind of defeated, title screen, and we get our other character rising into view. Here we have Zaya, who is sort of immediately identified with a very different mood than Kaisa. Like, Kaisa had this... I picked up Kaisa from, from, from Nekrit. Um, Kaisa has this very sort of dour, anxious, downbeat, lying in the gloom of her bedroom, looking defeated kind of vibe. Zaya is immediately presented with a very different mood. Like, this is much more sort of beautiful, aloof, more mature looking, kind of vaguely that. But she also has an object. And that object is a blue feather. Blue feather, which comes from uh, this guy who is hanging out up here. 
with her. Uh, it's a memento of Rakan. So just like uh, Kaisa has a memento of, of like a person with whom she has a very strong connection, Akali has a memento of a person with whom she has a very strong connection. This is going to be incredibly important. So there's a contrast being established between Kaisa and Akali, where we get the sense from like the way that she carries herself and the way that she looks a little bit more, a little bit older, a little bit more mature, that she's probably the more seasoned of the two, which comes into play with their body language and the ways in which they react to the things that are about to happen to them. So we establish a contrast between them, but we also establish a consonance, that they both have this one important object, which even the color grading, by the way, like you notice, we have the pink thing for Kaisa and the blue one for Kali, and then of course with Zaya, we have Zaya's purplish, pinkish, sort of reddish hair, and then we have um, Rakan's blue feather. So like there's a lot of, of, of parallels being established between these two couples of people, except of course, Akali and Kaisa are only friends. Um, and as like the light catches the feather here, like we get this little sort of glinting animation playing on the on the on the front of it. We see like the light from it flashes, and it flashes us into a flashback where we're seeing uh, Zaya and Rakan sitting on top of a school building, sort of being close to each other and being lovers. And nothing is happening in any of these frames. Like nothing here. There's no animation. There's no movement. There's no anything. All of the dynamic motion of this little quick flashback is created entirely by the digital movement of the camera, which is something if you watch anime, you'll be very familiar with this, where you have these sequences in, in TV anime where nothing is actually happening on screen. Like there's no movement happening anywhere on screen. Nobody's actually doing anything, but the camera is seemingly like handheld and shaking around or doing stuff sort of to imply motion and to imply a sense of, of life where a static frame obviously wouldn't do it. And here that camera motion is being used to emulate the idea of like, this is a shaky memory, right? Like where we're very distant from the actual action between the two. We're distant between from, from their interaction. And the camera is shaky and unsteady, which sort of gives the impression that this is like a fragile memory almost, like that this is a memory that's that's hard to that's hard for her to hold on to. And then we snap back to her, like as the wind kicks up and the feather gets pulled out of her hand. And you can see that she's not super happy about that. Like that's it is it is bad that this important object that she loves is being taken from her. And here we can talk about the concept of limited animation. Remember how I said um, a lot of animation history is like this long ongoing quest to doing as little work as possible while producing anima animation that looks high quality? Limited animation is another one of these ideas where in this frame, right, like Ak uh, uh, Akali, Zaya is reacting to the feather, like sort of being blown out of her hand. But if you pay attention here, like it's really, even here when like she begins to shift her weight, all of this, like her her waist, like the the, uh, the tie, like this part of the shirt, like the leg, it's only that, that part of her body that absolutely needs to move that is being animated at any given time. Like the animators are constantly like, if I don't need to move this body part, I'm not gonna animate it moving. I'm not gonna animate it doing anything because I wanna focus my labor and my attention on the parts of the body that absolutely do need to move in order to sell this motion and movement. Um, which is like, which is something you can't really do that here because here we have this full body running motion of Zaya chasing the feather out of the door. So you can't do limited animation here, but anytime you have something like this, where most of the body is static, but you need to animate parts of it in order to get an emotion across, you can do this, these little limited animation techniques in order to get away with doing less work. So remember what I talked about in terms of frame rates? The feather is moving on every sec, uh, moving on twos to start with, it looks like. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then it moves at one, two, three, 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 right? So they vary the frame rate with which the feather moves depending on the kind of motion that it's making. So here at the start, when it's floating out of the room, it's like the only thing moving and it's being animated more smoothly. And then as it comes up to this curve where it's slowing down a little bit in the frame, allowing Zaya a moment to catch up and allowing us a moment to, to look at it as it begins to fly away again, they animate it at a lower frame rate because that fits the motion that it's about to make. So we transition from Zaya chasing this feather that contains the memories of, of her lost love into this beautifully framed shot of Kaisa. Like you can see how she's being framed in between like the window panes um, of, of her room that creates this little, this little, little, little space in the middle of the actual picture that sort of draws your attention and like 
outlines her. And this is one of the most beautiful shots in the entire goddamn music video, because here is where they really put their budget down. Um, in terms of, like, this this one, they really invested a lot of time into the rendering, because, like, remember how we talked about limited animation? Like, if you don't need to animate something, don't do it. The couple of shots that are about to follow here do not follow that rule. Like, this is where, like, we want this to look impressive, we want this to look gorgeous. So we have invested a lot of rendering, like, a lot of lighting, a lot of texture, a lot of everything, and as she shifts a little bit. You see that? You see how the entire bedspread like that she's sitting on moves around as she shifts her weight, which gives it this beautifully organic, like really not realistic as such, but it gives it this organic, real feeling softness, like this real feeling of weight and and and, and gravity, both from, from Kaisa's body and from the bedspread uh, that she's sitting on, which is just gorgeous. And this is something that continues into the next couple of shots where this whole thing is just I don't I don't know how to explain to you just how much this is showing off. I suspect that some of it is 3D animation. I can't exactly tell which bits are 3D. I think that the the laptop is a 3D animated object. But that picture frame isn't. I'm reasonably sure that picture frame is hand animated. I'm reasonably sure that book there might be a 3D object. I think the bottle is hand animated and like a lot of the things that are just floating around in the room right now are hand animated as they float around like these these are 2d animated objects that are, that are being rotated in space and i don't know how to explain how difficult that actually is like because when you're animating a character when you're animating a person or an animal or like something that's biological you can kind of cheat like when it comes to rotating things in 3d space you you can cheat you can do all kinds of little fudges you can do all kinds of little hacks um to make it look fine and like nobody notices anything but but it's actually sort of three-dimensionally not quite right you can't really do that with super geometric objects like potted plants and chairs and glasses and books like these are hard geometric objects that need when they are rotated in space they need to be rotated correctly so look at that goddamn office chair over there you see that? You see how that's like, it's rotating around two axes at once. It's rotating this way around, and it's also rotating a little bit that way around. Um, and they do that by hand. Like, it's they, they could just have had a 3D object. Like, they could just have had a 3D object, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they traced over a 3D object for reference or whatever. They could just have had a 3D object do that, but instead they just chose to go to the labor and extra effort of hand animating something as complex as an office chair rotating in 3D space. And it's the same story with, like, the books and with the speakers, and I think the laptop, even though in the previous shot... I'm reasonably, I'm reasonably convinced that was a 3D object because, like, animating all those little goddamn keys floating around. No, no way you're doing that if you don't have to. Here, I think it's 2D animated, and all of the, all of the objects and all the stuff in the frame that's moving around is 2D animated, and that's just, that's wildly impressive, and it's also really excessive, and it's because they really wanted this scene, this moment with Kaisa when her room, like, begins to be affected by anti gravity, everything begins to float, and sort of move around we they wanted that to be visually impactful and one of the ways to do that is to invest a lot of your budget and not do limited animation here but the animation techniques we were talking about still apply kaisa moves all the stuff in the room moves kaisa moves all and then there the camera moves all the stuff in the room and kaisa kaisa all the stuff in the room kaisa and then you can see how like the animation frame rate is displaced right in order to create and that's what creates that incredible smoothness in this shot is because they are being careful to move things at the, those different frame rates which creates this beautiful vision um of smoothness in the image it's absolutely gorgeous and of course the thing which is causing this to happen at least visually that seems to be the implication is the amulet that once again symbolizes her relationship with akali akali of whom she has a picture right next to her computer on her desk because they're friends and like i could i could gush for a long time over just like the fucking bedspread that's floating around and you can see like the the little shapes of of like light and shadow moving around as the volume is being displaced as the gravity moves and the little bunny and like the the freaking bed itself like raising off off the floor and you can see how the like how the folds in the bed sheet are like displacing as it's being moved from the f it's oh a lot of technical competence on display here absolutely gorgeous and i really quite like it as we get set up into like my god fuck why would you do this by hand why why, 
Why? Why? Like, you could just, you could just have 3D animated it. It would have been so easy. No one would have noticed who wasn't like a weird nerd like me. But they did. And again, notice the frame rates being used separate from one another to create that illusion of perfect smoothness. Like, that that's a way to create the illusion of 24 frames per second animation without actually animating at 24 frames per second. Notice also, again, the difference in mood here. Like, notice the difference between the characters, because Kaisa is about to enter, like, the realm of, of memory and senses and sort of the, the, the metaphorical realm of her relationship with Akali, like, becoming a, an emotional center to the narrative that's being told in this animated short. And Zaya is doing the exact same thing, but notice the different mood with which they enter it. Like Kaisa is all like grasping her wrists and seems kind of scared, and like she's sort of she's sort of holding her shoulders tight and like being kind of worried and holding on to things and like like very sort of she's very sort of like sinking into herself physically in terms of the way that she's acting. Zaya doesn't. Zaya, like when, when Zaya's going after her thing, it's just like <laughs> <laughs> like she is fully chasing that thing like at a full sprint absolutely there's no there's no fear there's no apprehension there's no anything there's just desperation and that's because they have two different moods in terms of how they relate to the relationship that is at this emotional core of what's being told here kaiza with her relationship with akali has like it it is sort of a quiet emotional thing it's a thing of doubt it's a thing of like deep emotional attachment, but also like this push and pull between her duties as a star guardian and her like her relationship to her friend. Zaya and Rakan, it's different. Zaya isn't like she's not in doubt about anything, really. What the only thing she's in doubt about is whether or not she can save him, but she's active. She's desperate. Right, like that's that's the mood of her is like when she's chasing this feather down, you can see like she's stumbling over, she's almost falling, she's jumping up off the ground, she's like she's constantly almost losing her balance, she's reaching out, she's grasping for it. There's a there's this sense of overwhelming wild desperation in her motion and her movements because that's just how focused she is on holding on to this goddamn thing, right? Um, whereas with Kaisa, it's much more a mood of resignation and anxiety, much more a sense of being overwhelmed by her circumstances, and it's less that she's actively chasing anything than it is that she's going with the flow, essentially being led along. Anyway, Feather. Props to the animator who animated the feather, by the way. Feather is like this, like these soft, smooth things, like with lots of surface detail on them, can be a devil and a half to animate by hand because you have to keep that shape consistent. And like, you can see that they are tracing like this S curve through the air that the feather is following as it's flying away. Um, and like, it's like Zaya comes in grasping for it. And here they apply smearing and they do two kinds. Like they, they apply a uh, motion blur, which is something I hate in animation. Like it's a very useful tool. It's, it's good that they use it because it creates a lot of sense of motion and, and movement. And like, yeah, it makes sense. I just hate it because it makes it harder for me to see the stuff that's actually being drawn on screen, which is the stuff that I'm interested in. But you can also see that the shape of Zaya's hand here is like wildly distorted. That's, that's, that's not usually what a hand looks like. Uh, Zaya isn't that feathered, um, but what they're doing here is they're distorting the shape of the hand to match, like she's swiping down this way, so the, the shape of the hand is being smeared backwards in order to emphasize the motion of her basically swinging for the feather, right? Like you can see that, and that continues into like, as the motion gets less fast here, she's recovering. You can see the hand is still distorted, but less so. And here you can see like, again, you get you get these uh, speed lines and motion blurs and smears happening on her other hand. Like whatever part of her is moving the fastest sort of gets these motion blur lines applied to it in order to sort of smooth that motion. And this is also just a really impressive little like, Animating a body from this angle, like from this angle way down, you can see there's a lot of tilt in the camera. Like you can see the horizon line is not uh, completely horizontal. And then there's this huge, like like what they've applied to the scene also is this strong uh, spatial distortion. In order to animate Zaya running through the shot, the animator needs to be conscious of that lens distortion. They need to be conscious of how that distorts the anatomy of the body. So like the foreshortening on Zaya's arm as she's reaching down, you can see how big, like if we actually like take a look at how big this hand actually is relative to her torso, like here, visually her hand is like the same length and size as her entire torso because the artist is making sure in the foreshortening to make it bigger so that it fits the 
like theoretical camera lens. There is no camera lens, but they're emulating the distorting effects of that a camera lens with this kind of perspective would have on the body. And you can see that continues as she like straightens up and reaches for the feather again. You can see how like her whole body sort of elongates and becomes kind of weird looking a little bit. Um, because they're emulating like the effects of that lens distortion on on her motion and and her anatomy, which is just it's 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 genuinely goddamn impressive. Like that's technically speaking, that's that's really difficult to get right. Damn, like that's that's someone who has studied and who has looked at a lot of reference and who has like a really strong understanding of how human anatomy human she's a vestia but how anatomy is put together in order to make that work again motion smearing on the arm as she's like reaching out and it creates like this energy right like like i said the energy of zaya chasing down this feather is desperate like it's she's she's stumbling she's almost falling over her own feet she's jumping into the air she's trying to get to it like with everything that she has and that's all down to the animator being really good at like posing and positioning her and making goddamn sure that like like her internal state is reflected in the way that she moves through a space. And of course, as she's chasing down this feather, as she's becoming more and more desperate chasing it down, as she's becoming more and more desperate grasping for it, the darkness closes in, almost as though it's drawn by her desperation, almost as though like her her desperate clutching on to these relics and memories of Rakan are making her vulnerable to the influence of the darkness. And as she manages to just barely graze, just barely touch the feather for a second, another flash, just like the one that happened earlier, where we see again, just a brief blurry static shot memory. And as that memory hits her, right, you can see this is where she transforms into her dark star guardian costume. Like this is her corrupted guardian form when she was taken over by the darkness. She swipes for it again. Boom. Another flash. We get this other memory, once again, of, of their relationship. And the more she's grasping for it, the more desperately she's, she's, she's trying to get this feather, the deeper she falls into despair, the deeper she falls into darkness because her desperation is making her vulnerable. Switch in tone as we go back to Kaisa, who, rather than Zaya's desperate grasping running, is just slowly walking down these stairs. Again, with that very passive vibe, as though this is something that's just kind of happening to her, over which she herself feels kind of powerless. And again, we get the little glitter reminding us that this object is super important. Remember that this object is important. It matters a lot. As she stares into a window, where, of course, she sees her friend. Just a friend, like obviously just a friend, like nothing more than that. Um, staring back at her, like as a reflection of herself, she sees her as though she sees herself in Akali and Akali sees herself in, in Kaisa, as though their connection is very important. Um, they reach out towards each other once again, the bracelets. And as she touches that reflection, like this, this visualization of her relationship to Akali, something changes. And that's where we get the ghost of Lux hanging out in the background. Um, sort of intruding on their relationship, right? Like, before, only the two of them, only their relationship to each other, their friendship bracelets and so on, Akali smiling. Here, oop, all of a sudden there's an intruder. Lux doesn't take the place of Akali, but she shows up in the background like a ghost, like this thing that's hovering over Kaisa's shoulder and distracting her from the relationship. Once again, back to Zaya, where we kind of repeat the shot from the hallway, like we get this low angle looking up, um, with a little bit of camera shake being added for good measure, as once again, like, you just see, and again, like, that low camera angle is again about creating that sense of desperation. Like, that sense of speed and tension and unevenness, as you can see just how wildly Zaya is moving, just trying to get to this damn feather as she gets dragged into the darkness, finally. And the feather flies, like, the more she chases it, the more and more it flies out of her reach. Almost as though, like, the harder she works to try and capture, recapture this relationship, the further away it gets from her. The more obsessed she is with trying to hold on to it, the harder it becomes to, to keep hold of either the memories or the relationship that she has. And as Rakan's relationship with Zaya flies further and further out of Zaya's reach, we get this shot of Lux offering the power of the Star Guardian to Kaisa, like this, this ghost of this great guardian of the past hovering over her shoulder, offering like the power of the star guardian, this, this symbol of star guardianship, um, which is established like very cleverly, like we get the little glint bling, 
off here, and that's immediately mirrored as we cut back to the shot of Lux, Lux and we get like her Star Guardian headband giving that same glint, establishing a visual connection between these two things. This is Star Guardian power that's being offered. And in response to that, friendship bracelet starts starts gleaming, and Kaisa understands what's being asked here. Like, what is this outstretched hand asking for in return for that Star Guardian power? Well, this amulet that symbolizes the most important relationship in her life. And once again, Kaisa's reaction to that is less anger or upset or desperation or any kind of like wild emotional outburst. She's very timid. She's very down. Like she's very, it feels like, oh shit, this is being asked of me. It's a mood of powerlessness before this call that's being given to her. Once again, back to Zaya with some really gorgeous, like, like animating that cape along with the hair, just sort of flapping around, flying, like, flailing wildly back and forth as, once again, she almost touches the feather. Another memory of her relationship with Rakan as Rakan saves her from the darkness. And again, like, the feather flies further away, and here's Kaisa kissing the symbol of her relationship to Akali, because, of course, they're just friends. Like, just, they are, they are just friends, which is why she's kissing um, the friendship bracelet as she places it into Lux's other hand and exchanges their friendship for the power of the Star Guardian. And, like, that's, just in case it was too subtle for you before, we get this look of sort of a little bit of anger on Akali's face, like a little bit of, of like, like, wrath on her as the mirror image of her shatters and that shattered friendship then becomes Kaisa's Star Guardian armor. Like, so the visual storytelling here is like Kaisa sacrificed her relationship, her friendship with Akali in order to become a Star Guardian, not because she was like super enthusiastic about it, not because she was like really, really happy to do it, but because she felt like she was being called to do it. This was a duty, this was a responsibility for her. Like I said, this is a two minute piece of animation that needs to establish everything about these characters and their relationships. And this is Kaisa's whole entire story, is that she became a Star Guardian, but it cost her. It cost her that close friendship with Akali. And Akali becoming a Star Guardian alongside her was also is also like a thing that's marked with doubt and anger and like a lot of resentment about a lost relationship that she once valued very, very dearly. But, and again, like tears coming out of her eyes and crying because she's just sacrificed the relationship that's more important to her than anything else in order to gain the power of the Star Guardian. And she collapses, grasping onto her chest almost as though her heart hurts because of course, she and Akali are just friends. Um, and this is sort of the low point for both of our heroes in this thing is like, is like Kaisa having sacrificed her relationship collapsed in a lake of tears in darkness, clutching her chest as though as though her heart has been broken, with framed inside like the broken mirror where her where like where the reflection of Akali once was, because that relationship is now broken, in case you didn't get it. And Zaya's darkest moment as well is when she's running up the stairs, grasping for this feather, jumping for it at her highest point of desperation, and she finally freaking gets it, and it shatters. It just explodes. It just goes away. And as it shatters, we see her worst memories with Rakan is like sort of sort of what you can see. Like this seems like a moment of conflict in their relationship where she's sad and he's sort of vaguely trying to comfort her and she's sitting all alone on a building with no one next to her. This is the shattering of, of that memory that she's been holding on to so strongly. Like, this is this is her lowest point whatsoever because she finally caught the damn thing and then it was just destroyed right in front of her eyes. Like, as though, even though she chased it with so much desperation, even though she took on the Dark Star Guardian powers in order to get a hold of this thing, it still vanished out of her reach. Like, for her to never grab hold of it again. And you can see the despair beginning to set in in her face there. This is also the turning point, right? Like when you get to the, the lowest point for our heroes, this is like in a three act story structure, the, the 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 lowest point for the heroes is also the moment when they begin to rise into triumph or begin to, begin to sort of recover uh, from it. And this is where we finally see a shift in Kaisa's uh, animation in the way that she emotes, in the way that she acts. Before this, she has been all like sort of, oh, like, uh, like clutching her chest and like, oh, sort of like powerless and scared and worried and anxious and like, like, like very sort of uh, folding into herself in terms of her body language. Watch what she does now as we get a flash once again of that relationship, those two hands holding one another. Boom, like, 
Yeah, no more wilting flower, no more fear, no more worrying, no more nothing. Now we're just like, no, fuck this shit, I'm taking my relationship back. And her entire body language, like everything about the way that she carries herself, shifts in this moment. Like, no more, no more crossing her arms over her chest, no more sort of sinking into herself. Boom, power stance, big power stance. And then as she flies up, like, arms outstretched. Like, like a look of determination on her face, reaching out for the thing that she wants, which is, again, of course, the friendship, just the friendship. It's just a friendship. It's nothing else. It's just a friendship uh, with her friend, Akali, uh, who's her friend. <laughs> and similarly, the moment of return from the brink in quite literal terms here is as Zaya is desperately trying to reach for that relationship with Rakan, she gets pulled back by Seraphine who grasps her arm, and this again is like some really nice, like in terms of like, look at the way that like, um, like the foreshortening is working on Akali here, like with the hand reaching into the frame, and then the other arm as Seraphine's grabbing onto it, and just the, like you can see the stretch that happens here, right? Like the way that Akali's arm gets stretched and like the foreshortening gets more extreme as the, the front part of her leans further into frame, and Seraphine is pulling back. Like this elasticity as she swipes with her hand one last time trying to grasp it. And like just the extremity of like her expression too, like like it really sort of gets pushed very hard. Um, in these moments, like her whole body becomes almost elastic into like this flailing, wild swinging of the hair and the, and the cloak, and like this this visual chaos that's happening on screen as the feather once again flies out of her reach. And here again, like you can really see just the extremity of distortion that's actually happening to Zaya's body in this moment because the animator is trying to get you that feeling of like desperate flailing, like really like just like swiping in the air for something that she can't quite get a hold of. As the feather finally flies out of her reach forever, we also see that she was about to jump off a fucking building. <laughs> <laughs> that she had been so captured, she'd been so lost in this desperate chase of the feather of the relationship with Rakan, that she was about to throw herself off a goddamn building. She was about to kill herself, essentially, right? Like she was about to, to quite, she was quite literally going one step closer to the edge and just about to break. Like that's literally what's happening here. The visual language is literally that her relentless chase of this thing was about to pull her over the edge. And it is the intervention of Seraphine and her friends that finally pulls her back from it, which she's not super happy about. And I really, like, this is a small thing, but this motion right here, like as Seraphine has like, has like pulled her back from the edge, right? She gets dragged backwards. And you can really see that she's resisting Seraphine. Like Seraphine is leaning her entire weight into this, just trying to pull this crazy woman off <laughs> the ledge of a building. And as Zaya realizes that she's being pulled back from it, you can see she plants her weight and then heaves. Like, I really like this little motion, like this. It's a simple thing, right? Like it's not, it's not a very detailed animation because they're so small on screen, but you get that sense of like, She's pushing down with her leg and she's like, no, let me go. I have to jump off this building because I'm chasing this thing that I'm so fixated on, even though it's even though it's going to hurt me. And I just I really love I love the acting between the guardians here, like like again, that wildness, that sort of desperation, that uncoordinated movement from Zaya, where she's just kind of flailing her arms like oh, fucking get off me. I need to ah, I need to chase this thing. I need to. And then like as she realizes that it's out of her reach, the way that she collapses into just complete despair. And look at the acting on the other characters. Look at Seraphine, who's like, you can see just in the way that, not just her expression, but the way her body language works, like where she pulls back. And then you can see, she, she, like, she looks to Senna for just a second for like, what the hell am I supposed to do here? And then she starts to try and reach out again. And you can see the same thing from Senna. Like, it's a very subtle little bit of movement where like, as Zaya collapses, you can see that Senna and Seraphine, like both are sort of like, they're sort of trying to figure out what to do with their hands, right? Like, they're trying to figure out, like, uh, should I try and touch her? Like, what should I do? How can I help her? Um, whereas Oriana, who's sort of the more anxious um, of them all, is like, again, much like Kaisa did previously, bringing her arms up in front of her chest, sort of protectively, because she's scared. Like, she's worried about what's happening. And it's just, it's just really good character acting. Like, it's just really well acted from these characters like to sort of convey what their mood and what their relationship is and what what each of them want in this moment what they're trying to do as she then like collapses down into just full chest sobbing and despair 
that she can't like she can't save the one she loves. Another wonderful little bit of framing, like you can see Seraphine being framed uh, between the two bars of of like the school roof, and the same thing with Cinna. as they like slowly begin to approach her. And here's something else, like again, in terms of the visual storytelling and the economy of storytelling that's happening here, Seraphine touches Saya and empathizes with her grief. Like you can see that she too feels the pain. Like she's crying for Zaya. She's empathizing with her. She is, she's like, she's taking on the grief. She's trying to be a friend to her. And that embrace when it happens here. Storytelling, once again, as Seraphine embraces Zaya, as she embraces her friend, instead of that negative memory like that's what we ended on with Zaya is was this negative memory like this moment of conflict and loneliness where her relationship with Rakan had suffered some kind of damage instead we get all the best moments the moments when Rakan reaches out to her silly moments when she's hanging out with her boyfriend when he's teasing her by stealing her like stealing her drink when they have a little intimate moment together when they're doing hot ass star guardian tango shit or whatever um when he's reaching out to her when he was there for her all of the good memories come rushing back right? And that's that moment of, of empathy and connection from Seraphine, from her friend, helps her reclaim her connection to the good memories, to the beautiful things, to the things that she wants, like the, the reasons why this relationship is important to her. She doesn't need the feather. She doesn't need the trinket. She doesn't need the object. What she needs is the care and attention and love of the people around her in order to help her hold on to the things that are actually important to her, in order to bring her, literally pull her back from the abyss and of course, that kind of empathy hurts. It hurts like a bitch. Like when you are already hurting and then someone reaches out to you with empathy and kindness and care, it starts hurting a lot more. Like because all of the stuff that you're holding back just pops right out of you. It's a painful moment and it's animated so goddamn well. Like if you have any empathy for this character at this point, like you, if you really are empathizing with how she feels, you do kind of feel like things like welling up a little bit inside of you because like, goddamn, like... Girls going through it. And it's the final little touch, again, just in case you didn't get it. This thing doesn't have time for subtlety. Like, subtlety is not allowed here because we only have two minutes to work with and people need to get it. The embrace from Seraphine and from her group of friends is also the thing that transforms her out of her corrupted Star Guardian form into her purified Star Guardian form. This is the thing that holds her where she is. And of course, if you played the the, the Star Guardian visual novel, one of the one of the cruxes of Zaya's story there is that she realizes that, hang on, the darkness isn't like an opposite. Like the darkness is is in me, but it's not the only thing that's in me. I can I can embody both things. And it's like and that's how she learns how to save Rakan is by holding both of these things within herself. And that's the thing she she uses to pull Rakan back from the same edge. Like that, no, we don't need to purge all of the darkness out of you. We need to help you learn how to manage the darkness. How do you manage the darkness? How do you main get control over your own darkest impulses and emotions? Well, community. Kindness, compassion, caring, loving relationships and friendships, that's what pulls your ass back from the edge. Which, of course, as we cut into Kaisa's POV once again, she's reaching out, like, we saw her last, like, bursting out of the darkness and reaching out for the relationship that she wants. She gets the sense that she's being reached out to by Akali, right? Like, she's waking up in this, this green grassy field, which, incidentally, is also where we started. It's like poetry, it rhymes. We start in a green grassy field um, with people holding hands with one another, and that's where we end as well. She has the sense that, oh, there she is, there's my friend, there's the thing I've been looking for. Except, of course, it's actually Sona um, and her other friend group who are reaching out to her just as the other Star Guardians reach out to Zaya. These people reach out to Kaisa, and that is the thing that creates hope for some kind of future. Like, like hope that they can achieve their goals and get to where they want to get and do the things that they need to do simple storytelling but all of this and it's taken me i know 45 minutes uh, at least to talk about this but all of this conveyed in just two minutes using only visual language and absolutely no dialogue whatsoever like the lyrics of the song do play into it a little bit like um don't try to make yourself remember darling don't look for me i'm just a story you've been told and everything will go on after our relationships are over that's sort of in the lyrics of the song but the animation itself has to carry this entire narrative with absolutely no help from dialogue, it has to establish these connections between these characters, why it matters, like what the emotional stakes of the situation are. And it does it genuinely, absolutely brilliantly, because like 
Telling one character's story in two minutes can sometimes be a challenge. Telling two characters' story in two minutes is a much bigger challenge, and the way it does it is by establishing that close, close, close thematic connection that Zaya's relationship with Rakan and Akali's relationship with Kaisa are, in essence, the same thing. Like, these two people are going through, in essence, the same thing. Like, this fear of a broken relationship that they are desperate to find some kind of way to mend, right? And I know I just spent a bunch of time telling you that the entire storytelling of this music video revolves around the idea that Kaiza's relationship with Akali is the same as Zaya's relationship with Rakan. And I know that it opens with Kaiza and Akali laying together and holding hands and Kaiza staring at Akali's face through golden light and soft focus and that Kaiza kisses the symbol of their relationship with her lips and that when their relationship suffers a fracture, she collapses in a lake of tears clutching her chest as though her heart is hurting. And I know that all of that might seem like it's extremely obvious romantic imagery that's definitely implying a romantic connection between these two characters, but don't worry about that. Just don't think about it. Just th don't think about those things because they are definitely just gal pals. Anyway, it's very good storytelling. Uh, I kind of choked up a little bit. I don't know if you could hear that in my voice. I choked up a couple of times just talking about it because the animation and the staging and the way that it's all put together, it does such a good job of bringing you into their mind space. Like it does such a good job of bringing you into how these characters are feeling and why it matters so much. And at least for me, like, it brings to mind those moments in my own life where, like, yeah, no, yeah, I know that feeling, Zaya, um, of chasing something so desperately and being so fixated on it that you almost hurt yourself, and then someone brings you back from the brink, and that's emotionally a very painful moment, but also healing. Yeah, no, I've been there, girl. Uh, know that feel, but I think it's very good. Like, just in terms of how much it get acro gets across in such a short time especially compared to like the stuff that the actual Star Guardian event was about. It was about these two relationships. It was about, and again, right here at the end, it draws that equivalence again that Akali and Rakan are both like these distant figures who are not, they're not standing together. They have like their backs to one another, but they are also separate and lonely compared to everybody else where Akali has the friendship bracelet. You can see it glinting on her wrist. And Rakan, of course, is holding on to the feather that Zaya was chasing this whole entire time. Just, just, just again, because no subtlety whatsoever, the, ch the chase for these two people is the same quest, essentially. Trying to bring those two back from the darkness is the same thing. And, he, and again, just in case you didn't get it, literal split screen with Zaya in the dark, because that's the realm, that's the power that she has learned to master. And Kaisa, the avatar of the light, like where you have like the, the 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 comet that symbolizes the star guardians streaking across the sky in her background. Both of them like start out by looking down, sort of a little bit dour, um, and then they look up with renewed hope and determination for the future because their friends have pulled them back from the brink, etc., etc. No subtlety, but God, it works. Like it works so damn well. This is just a, it's a really really good music video. I don't know that the Star Guardian event fully lived up to it, <laughs> unfortunately, but frankly, that was maybe also a very tall order. Anyway, I've talked enough. It's enough. I need to shut the fuck up now. If you have enjoyed this uh, rather wild and rambling animation breakdown, you are more than welcome to uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, like and comment, and do other things. Uh, since this video was sponsored, I'm not going to do the whole self-promotion thing with, like, if you want to support the channel, you can. Um, I have a second channel where I do Let's Plays of things. I have a Twitch channel where I stream me doing Let's Plays of things. Check those out if you want. And other than that, thank you very much for watching. Be kind to one another. Have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourself. And may the tides of history wash gently over us all. Hey.